So we have to in the end be answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day. Right? And so for a country to succeed anywhere, don't play around with this heady mix of religion and nationalist populism. Mm. It can be very dangerous really. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to Kindred Salaam, Stories uh, with me, Sharil Hamdan. And me, Kairi Jamaluddin or KJ. KJ, we have a very special guest uh, today. Mm. Today is our fourth episode of Kindred Stories. But before we get to it, um, maybe a word or two about our previous episode yes. with Ayana Moon, uh, which was an experience, I think, for both of us. Uh, not the most... Um, well-trodden ground for both of us in terms of speaking to a female influencer uh, um, with hijab who was a revert from her Korean culture or her Korean roots into Islam, now lives in Malaysia and Indonesia. I thought the by, all the, by the looks of it, the episode was well-received. Very positive comments about her life story, mm. about her hijrah, um, reverting back to Islam, converting to Islam for, for some. And I think uh, the strength of her character really came through in the comments as somebody who is independent, as someone who's strong, as someone who is not apologetic about being an entrepreneur mm. uh, and making money, really. But at the same time, really exploring her faith and strengthening her iman. And I thought that was a wonderful story for many, not just women, mm. uh, but also Muslims, looking at how she's able to strengthen her faith, but at the same time, really confront her roots, which in Korean society, I suppose, very, very alien to Muslim society. It's mm. very homogenous society. And she mentioned about her challenges, converting and trying to reconcile that with her family. So yeah, wonderful story. And I think of all the guests we've interviewed across our different podcasts, KJ, that was one of the most candid interviews I've had. Oh yeah, uh, she, she was, she was yeah, quite unfiltered. She was unfiltered. <laughs> she was very happy to call out what, in her own words, I guess the prejudice of her own culture mm. about Islam, yeah. towards Islam. Uh, she was very happy to be assertive about her own identity as a woman, as an entrepreneur, as you correctly mentioned. And I absolutely love that bit, I suppose, because in my mind, KJ, kindred stories, apart from obviously... Uh, seeking knowledge, showing kindness. It's also about trying to bring to bear the relationship between duniawi and akhirat. Relationship between um, how our religion teaches to teaches us to go forth in the world. And I think uh, those kind of stories where people are unfiltered, people manifest exactly that spirit or that sentiment is, is what makes our episode or makes this show um, enjoyable, at least for me. And I think uh, this episode will be uh, uh, definitely an addition to that particular theme of going forth in this world with the basis of Islam and our spirituality and religiosity of our religion. And the guest we have today is Datuk Dr. Afifi Al-Akiti. He is the Kuwait Fellow at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, lecturer in Islamic Studies at the Faculty of Theology, which is Oxford University's oldest faculty. So I have two uh, Oxford. What, what do you guys call yourselves? Oxfordians? Oxonians. Oh, Oxonians. That's how we have to say it. Oxonians. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, which, uh, you know, um, it does pull at certain strings as somebody who's uni graduated from University of Manchester. So, you know, the North-South divide. Oh, but you're a Mancunian. Uh, I'm a Mancunian. Right. Um, speaking to two Oxonians. Um, I guess, uh, first of all, thank you very much and welcome, Dr. Dr. Afifi. Uh, thank you for coming to Kindred Stories. Welcome, Sharil. Uh, great. Well, thank you for inviting me. In fact, uh, so uh, this is more of a re reunion with, with Khairi, really. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, good, good to see an old friend. Yeah, yes. I'm like the third wheel here. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> third wheel is always the best one, by the way. Oh, really? Is that so? so it, it really balances the two. Okay. Very In good, a tricycle. Right? In a tricycle. In a tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, we'll start by I first came across Afifi, Sheikh Afifi, uh, in the library Inshallah. of the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. This was when I went back to Oxford as mm -hmm. a as a visiting fellow, I think in the early two thousand. And I was just, just before you got married, I think. No, no, it? just after. Oh, just after. Just okay, after. There you go. This and is the honeymoon. <laughs> 
yes. <laughs> and I was in the library, and this was the old Oxford Center for Islam uh, for Islamic Studies, not the new wonderful building that uh, Fifi occupies now on George Street. Yep. And uh, I was in the library late in the evening. It was dark, and suddenly I I heard something scurrying in the in the dark corners of the library, and then <laughs> this song quote pops up. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, yes, hello. And I was like, hello. And I immediately knew it was uh, Melayu because uh, Malays, we we have this uh, yeah, ho- homing instinct. Right. Okay, this okay. guy's Malay. Um, and that's how we got to know each other. Sure. And and I think uh, that was quite early on. And you, yeah. you were still a DPhil yeah. student doing your doctorate right. in, in Oxford. And, and now you're a full-blown uh, Don. I think you're the first... Malay and congratulations to the first Malaysian on Credit Stories. We've had uh, a Kiwi, we've had we've had an Indonesian, we've had Indonesians, we've wow. had Korean. Right. The first Malaysian, uh, apart from that, being the first Malay as a as a fellow uh, at Worcester. That's how I got to know um, Afifi. Um, but interestingly, as Sharil mentioned, he teaches um, not just at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, but he teaches at the at the Department of Theology. Mm-hmm. which is the oldest faculty in Oxford. Oxford was set up to yep. teach priests. Yep. Um, yep. I don't know, a thousand years ago, whatever it was. It was, it was a madrasa it was, for Christians. It was it? a madrasa, there you go, a madrasa for Christians. Um, so maybe you want to kickstart with uh, with your life story, Sharil? You want, you, yeah, um, we, we always love to, to yeah. get a bit of a back backstory of people who come on our show. Um, I guess maybe a simple question for you. How is it a uh, Malay Muslim, I understand from Perak, uh, ended up being the dawn in Oxford? Well, I think this is partly, Sharil, again, thank you for, for this wonderful uh, occasion to spend the time in Ramadan in Malaysia and to get to meet the two of you, really. And... Uh, but really, it's the barakah of our ulama. I mean, I have to say that. Um, when you study in the tradition that we do, particularly in the classical tradition of Islam, where you actually study with shuyukh, you know, or the Malays call Tok Guru, or the, the, the Javanese say Tok Kiais, for example. So you have that kind of a one-to-one relationship, a very personal relationship, the sort of thing that our young ones will understand from Star Wars, the Jedi Master and the, the Paduan kind of relationship. And those of us who actually have been to Oxford and studied in Oxford and indeed taught in Oxford will know that is precisely that is precisely the modus operandi, that is precisely how Oxford actually operates. It's to have that relationship with your teacher. So so certainly, I mean, I, I spend, you know, the younger part of my life basically almost, uh, I don't want to use the term as an itinerant traveller or something like that, but really, you know, went to go and study with, with these great uh, sages, if you like, um, where to, was it a point where that, you know, so in Indonesia, mm. then a bit of time in Syria, and then spend a bit of time certainly in Morocco, you know, a couple of years there. And uh, it, it's, 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 it's the result being in, in Malaysia, I don't even have a, what they say the SPM, which is the formal <laughs> secondary school certificate. It's like the GCSE, it's like the O-level, no. but this is a lesson just because you don't have the SPM doesn't mean you can't survive in the world. How did you end up in university without these so formal, you, so you went to these madrasas, had these one-on-one so tutorials? So I ended up being an imam in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, mashallah, and it was a very interesting experience for me. So when I was there, of course, so that was really the opportunity for me to take and do my A-levels. Oh. And this is one of the things, you see, that I learned from Malaysia, where people, you know, the rules stifle you. If you don't have O levels, you can't do A levels, for example. That's not the sort of barriers people put necessarily in the West. And this is one of the things that perhaps our people must Mm. uh, wake up and smell the coffee a bit here. I mean, I I didn't even know the fact that, for instance, if you didn't do SPM, you can't do SPM, for instance, right? Or you, you, you know, you can't get a leg up in life. But this is one opportunity you actually have. And, uh, you know, and the rest, as they say, is history. Right. In fact, what was even more interesting, because, you know, you know, having studied with the ulama, of course, you've got your, your the Arabic, you've got, you know, you, you've gone through and, you know, done the, the basics to the whatever, for the Kifaya and, and, and so on and so forth. I have to say, you know, and the French say this, the pet you know, the sins of the youth. You, f- the gra- you feel the grass is always greener on the other side. You had enough of studying the Malays called Agama, <laughs> whether it is Akida, Fiqh, Tasawwuf, you know, 
This Quran, is the, the Malay religious education this, system. You know, I mean, you know, in 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 the Muslim world, we have that tradition certainly. The grass is always greener on the other side. So you always feel, oh, you've never got the chance wanting to do sciences, for instance. So mm. there was an experience then when I was imam in in Belfast, and I actually, in fact, wanted to do something different. Technically, even run away from Islamic studies. Can mm. you imagine it? Mm. I mean, so I ended up with I, I, you know, I can't say. I mean, I think it's very embarrassing on air to say what would the A level grades I got. But suffice it to say, it was only through a sheer miracle I went through and applied to do originally food science at the Queen's University of Belfast. You were about to become a food scientist. Exactly. Wow. Can you imagine it? And 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 but within the first year, because of one of the papers I took was ancient science, you know, a bit on Aristotle there. And in the second term or the second semester, it had to do with medieval science. And in medieval science, they actually teach you about how science developed certainly from the Muslim world. Mm. And these are papers taught by non-Muslims. So it really opened my eyes. These are Orientalists, you know, and then you thought, whoa, I mean, these people can read Arabic as well as we do and sometimes even better. And then you thought, but then, you know, when I got the invitation from the professor who taught me, and he said, look, you're in the wrong faculty. Mm. I mean, you, you're certainly gifted with languages. You're certainly... You know, uh, you have great interest in philosophy, with theology, certainly because you know we were trained in the madrasas. In the, in the, uh, yep. So of course, uh, why don't you come and do history and philosophy of science? And so of course, the faculty that admitted me, uh, if, you know, food science. Originally, you know, if you do your A levels, it's embarrassing for me to say this, but this is the truth. <clears throat> you go through a, a, a process called clearing. Only if you get this sort of grades where you're not <laughs> AAAs, you know, no. but only perhaps because you know because you never had that proper training sure, and things like sure, it took sure. a bit of time for me to develop my writing Doctor, skills. I think after know. all your achievements, this is, you don't need to be I do, I embarrassed about I mean, but, going but through this clearing. Is, this is you're in Oxford, true. Don. It's okay. But yeah. You see, for someone who went through clearing, yes, can now up. teach in Oxford. Yeah, That's this what, is nothing. No, not only short we can of, end the episode there. Not not <laughs> not only short of a miracle, but it shows how working hard gets you somewhere. Yeah, yeah. for the benefit of our listeners who maybe don't know, clearing clearing is when you apply for the second time, right? After oh, the so first. when you- Not so much you, second, first you, time as well, but you, you almost fail. Your, your, yeah. your original your, choices didn't admit didn't you, admit so you have to go back into the pool and yes. they will assign you- Exactly, round, uh, exactly. And, and and course that's still they had to interview me, I mean, interview me. And I remember that year, SubhanAllah was the year when my first son was born. And the Malays have this saying, you know, uh, anak bawa rezeki, yeah. right? The, with, with the child, he or she, you know, brings you provision. Yeah. And I've always tried to find the provenance for this in the, in the Muslim tradition. I really can't quite find it yeah. specifically. It's a very Nusantara Malay thing. I think it's thing. a Malay thing. It is, it is a, a Malay thing. thing. And so I, I attribute this to my elder son that I got into the university against all odds, uh, amazingly enough. But the rest as this is history because by the second year of my university, I then picked up on the languages pretty well. And of course I had to be retrained, you know, and then, you know, I did Greek there and then, and then Latin for the medieval science, Greek for the ancient science bit. By the time I finished, I got a first class, a de valedictorian in the, in, in the year mm. for the joint degree double first in scholastic philosophy, which is Catholic philosophy and the history and philosophy of science. So there may be people out there asking, what is an ulama doing, a so-called alim doing here, doing Christian philosophy? But well, you've done everything you can pretty much when you sit with the ulama. And, and my feeling is that I want to do something different. It's this feeling that the grass is greener on the other side, you see. Yeah. It's this, you want to do sciences. But, you know, but then I realized, even when I wanted to run away from Islamic studies, Allah works in mysterious ways. You know, the ulama, they say, Al insan Allah That man proposes, God disposes. Mm. For Malays, they say, Kita merancang Tuhan yang menentukan. So my professor, the one at Queen's then, Called up his other professor in, in, in Oxford, you know, a German famous scholar, Fritz Zimmermann, very strict Germanic kind of, you know, uh, 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 Professor Don, uh, originally from Germany, teaches in Oxford, said, look, we've got somebody here that I've reached the end of my, <laughs> I can't teach him any further. So I, I won the Clarendon scholarship to go to Oxford. So as you know, Khairi, you, you can either be a Rhodes scholar or a Clarendon scholar. So I'm one of the blues, the, the Clarendon and Rhodes is the other color. And I had that scholarship all the way through uh, to, to finishing. And when I arrived in Oxford, 
in that year of 9/11 2001 mm. i will never forget this that when i then it just dawned on me when i was you know I matriculated at wuster college uh to do medieval islamic philosophy right and then i just thought to myself subhanallah alazim i've written where i wanted to run away from so that is god memang ada tu i mean i just yeah. that that kind of feeling you know made you feel who even when i wanted to run away from something i just wanted to be a scientist or wanted, yeah. i just wanted to do something different you know so and, tell and us about that afif because you went up to oxford as you said in 2001 mm-hmm. that's when the september 11th attacks yeah. took place yeah subsequent to that everything that had to do with islam became quote unquote trendy in mm. the western world mm. there was a lot of scholarship about uh, islam there was a lot of interest about islam mm. about trying to understand islam as well as uh, trying to vilify yep. islam and there you were uh, at oxford doing your phd or mm. dphil doctorate mm-hmm. as they call it in in oxford oh dphil dphil yeah. yes mm-hmm. not phd yes sure. Um, We just want to be different from the rest of the sure. world, so, especially the other place. So, <laughs> Cambridge. T- tell us about the intellectual milieu or environment in the West at that time when you went up. It was very interesting, Harry. I mean, it was in the game the year of 9/11. In fact, I literally arrived just over the summer. I remember that episode. Uh, you know, everybody probably remembers that episode. It's one of the days in your where life you were, where yeah. you remember where you were. And and you know the climate was such that within the first few weeks, I remember there was an attack at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies. You know where somebody came up with a baseball bat, wanting to you know rush the place. You know, and of course the the, the university had to call the the police and and all that just because of the name Islam. And and then at that time they were not even sure who did it and all that etc. etc. And so this is the climate of fear. I mean, of course, you will now know the term that is actually much more established now, which used to be and still in some circles uh, controversial, Islamophobia, right? Or anti-Muslim sentiment, which is which is quite high. And that's partly because, I mean, I if you ask me, it's really, you know, Imam al-Ghazali, my my hero, if hero. Like my, my, my role model, um, he says, An-nasu a'da umma jahilu, right? People are enemies of what they are ignorant of. I mean, an amazing saying of Imam Ghazali. This is the problem of it's a human problem, with the fear of the unknown. But in fact, he didn't learn this just from Islam. Actually, he he got it. I mean, certainly, a much earlier philosopher, by the name of Cicero, the great that great Roman orator and philosopher, actually said in Latin, "Dam dan quod non intelligent." You know, so people condemn the things they don't understand. That's partly our fault that people fear Islam. It may be because we do not carry ourselves in the way that we should be carrying ourselves in in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in accordance with the Quran. Did that you motivate know? you as a PhD, a uh, DPhil student, doctorate student, mm. to stay on and become this professor, this lecturer, <laughs> uh, as your part in yeah. trying to explain the unknown to the Western world in the oldest university in the Western world? <laughs> well, to, to again to be frank, Harry, uh, I never never intended. To end up teaching there, but again, this is one of those takdir. It's like, and this is due to the rezeki of my second son now. <laughs> you know, I, I, it took me a couple of years to finish my DPhil, my thesis. You know, a lot so of I, uh, kindred stories. Listeners going to start having kids now. <laughs> <laughs> do you have kids, Sharif? I do have. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. You know, indeed, we all have yeah. kids, and I think we all have rezeki comes in many forms. Certainly, uh, you know, doors open through through these children, and I, you know. Having writer's block is one thing, you know, and having to write your thesis. But the year in which my second son was born, uh, it was also the same year I submitted my thesis. And unexpectedly, the professor who held my chair, that fellowship, you know, got better offers from, <clears throat> as always, the United States, mm. you know, across the pond. And then he went there and I applied. And Alin San Yudabiru, Allah you know, you just went there, three days of interviews and voila. As the French say, and it was really, mashallah, you know, it was really unexpected at the tender age of 32. So I became a permanent staff of of, of the university, and and it was a great honor, of course, you know, for me. And of course, you know, and as you said it earlier, I think Malaysians are always proud. I always say, you know, they, they say the first Malaysians, then, you know, from the Nusantara, also, you know, the Indonesians, the Bruneians, the Singaporeans, <laughs> the, the Thais, you know. But uh, indeed, I after having. Uh, being an appointed, and of course, 
even before then, even when I was a student, when I arrived in Oxford, when I was then humbled by that experience that I wanted to run away from Islamic studies, and then Allah end up, you know, God end up sending me to do Islamic studies. Then I realized I should not fight fate anymore. Yeah. It's part of in Star Wars, you know, destiny. And I immediately taught. I mean, I continued my teaching just as I did in Belfast, you know, the madrasa, the Shafi'i fiqh madrasa there, in Sunni theology there. So I continued teaching and of course the local community accepted me with open arms and I taught in the local Jami Mosque, which is the Oxford Central Mosque, for years that I taught that. So that for me is part of my having to give back to the mm. community, to the mm. society. So already from that point, before I was even appointed, because of the experience I had to go through, that 9-11, that when we were discriminated against, you know, as Muslims, then I thought it is very, very important that we give the more correct uh, version and, and, and picture of Islam. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm sure we'll go back to this relationship of um, a Muslim dawn in the West, right. Islam in the West, uh, but maybe we want to go into your thesis for your DPhil, for yeah. your yeah. PhD. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your role model, Imam Al-Ghazali. Mm. Maybe speak in, in very broad terms to begin with. What about his um, thinking? What about his thought that appealed to you from the start? And what continues to appeal to you today? Yeah, I, I, and it, <sighs> Imam al-Ghazali is one of those amazing geniuses of not just the Ummah, the community of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but also in fact for the entire world. Uh, he is the so-called universal Islamic scholar, I would think. I mean, he, you know, when we talk about who is the universal Christian scholar, people think of Thomas, Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas. Right? Exactly. I mean, you know, people think of natural law, you think of mm. Thomas Aquinas, you ask, you know, who's the universal a Jewish scholar, that's Maimonides, Maimonides, by the way, who grew up in Islamic Spain, in Andalusia, mm. and end up being the doctor, the personal physician to Salahuddin, al Ayubi, Saladin, who, you know, obviously we all know, you know, has fought with Richard the Lionheart, but of course, most famously, he, he, he liberated Jerusalem again. So Al-Ghazali was this figure who is known as Hujatul Islam in the Muslim tradition. Interestingly, his, his title, the proof of the religion, the proof of Islam, almost as if he's an ambassador, you know, to, to Islam. And true enough, both Maimonides and Thomas Aquinas both benefited greatly from him in varying degrees, whether as a friend or even as a foe. I mean, Thomas Aquinas, for example, I mean, you know, very well-respected Christian theologian. He wrote this massive magnum opus called Summa Theologica, which is partly inspired by a lot of Al-Ghazali's ideas, but he wrote this other book called Summa Contra Gentiles in, in, in Latin. Essentially what it means in English is a book or a, sum, a summary or summation of a book that is against, for him, kufur, <laughs> kafir, or the non-believers, you know, for him, the Gentiles. And the main reason why he wrote that book is because he was having Al-Ghazali well, at the back of his hand. You know? Both so, Thomas Aquinas and um, Imam Ghazali in very layman's terms, yes. um, they contributed to their own religion because they used existing philosophical structures mm. to prove mm. the existence of, of God, God yeah. and of their religion. Yeah. That's why he's the proof of Islam. Yeah. I think maybe yeah. expound a little bit upon that. Yeah, I mean, look, Al-Ghazali, interestingly enough, was one of the theologians in the history of mankind, where he basically actually promoted the idea of uh, what later on both philosophers and theologians call the methodic doubt. And you will remember who was famous for this, of course, N not so much a very religious person, but somebody who famously started off the so-called enlightenment movement in Descartes. the West. Descartes, exactly, the Cartesian methodic doubt. You know, you, you will go through this kind of journey to try and even doubt the existence of even God. I think therefore I am. I think therefore I am, cogito ego sum. So Al-Ghazali had precisely that. And of course he predated Descartes by a couple of hundred years. And if you read his autobiography, Khairi, I mean, it's amazing. I think this should be mass reading for our work. I mean, if you read you know, uh, well, uh, an ulama, uh, this is an autobiography. Again, it's not normal for you to write an autobiography to mm. begin with. Uh, and you have people like St. Augustine who wrote his Confessions, right? It's a very famous autobiography. But this is one of the few other scholars in the world who's written an autobiography. And it's an amazing journey of how he, as an, one of the ulama, who had difficulty with his faith, with his iman. He went away for a period of time he, for a few he, years. He right? had a crisis of faith. Yeah. 
Mm. So here we have your. There was can you, you, there was you studying food sciences. <laughs> exactly, exactly. My pet is your name, right? Your your crisis of the your yeah. kind of your crisis of faith. So here, the great Imam, he was he was not secure even in his own Iman. Yeah, and he was very transparent about it, right? mm. and that's why sometimes, whether we one of the famous Catholic popes, you know, passed away, the Pope John the Second, you know, Paul. I mean, uh, 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 said that. Uh, faith, uh, doubt, sorry, doubt is the handmaiden of faith. Mm. John Paul II famously said that. Mm. Well, this mm. is something, whether he realized it or not, he, he would have learned from al Ghazali. Of course, he learned it from Descartes in that sense. Yeah. But I think it, it, it's an amazing journey of this great scholar where he was searching for God, if you like, and finally found God through that experience of, you know, he had to go through, you know, he started off with with fiqh, with, you know, basic law, he became a lawyer. He knew that, you know, if you're a lawyer, you get, you know, you can get very rich and just, it, you know, things are no different. And yeah. today you can have lawyers, the Malays have a nice thing, you know, you know, you can be a crooked lawyer if you're a lawyer bohok. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to translate that in English, right? <laughs> but it's true. And these are lawyers who do law without the knowledge of spirituality. So, I mean, you know, but Al-Ghazali went through from law and then he studied even philosophy, to try and find God, you know, but then in the end he found Tasawuf, Sufism, right? Mm. Which is the science of the heart, which is universal in all That's religions. Right. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, and unfortunately now with some Muslims, Tasawuf, Sufism has become a bad word. Because mm. they think particularly with some Muslims, particularly those Muslims coming from the right, so to speak, you know, they're a bit literal minded or literally minded. So, you know, and, and, and that's very sad. It's, it's, it's actually part of the religion of Islam. It's part of the basics of Islam to, for us to study. You do theology, you do law, and you do Sufism. If we, I can just jump in here. Yeah, okay, sure. Because, because I, I, I did SPM ah, and I, right. I studied here. Right. I remember... He's in, establishing that because he's the yeah. only one probably with a full set of SPM. Yeah, right? yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm glad to know that. But the relevance here, if I can inject, is uh, I have some memory, uh, right. KJ and Doctor, of being told to be careful with Al-Ghazali. Oh, um, ah. So that maybe begins to speak to your point about in certain parts of our religion, how we practice it. Right. Uh, there is a right. certain, you know, uh, uh, guidance or right. not guidance, but then carefulness, right. caution right. about getting too close to Sufism right. and, and, and yeah. that, right? Yeah. And, and maybe yeah. I wanted to sort of say that that was a bit of my experience growing up here. Uh, and can you imagine it, Sharif, for someone to say, be careful of Imam Al-Ghazali when universally, mm. the majority of all the Muslims accepting, including his intellectual madhab enemies. You know, he, he followed the madhab of Imam Shafi, the school of Imam Shafi in law. He's followed the school of Imam Ash'ari in theology. Yeah. And, and, but clearly you would expect, you know, the, the Shias would disagree with him, but even the Shia brothers and sisters, Muslims here in this case, right? Embraced him. I mean, yeah. you know, so again, I, I know where this is probably coming from. It's, it's the minority of those, the naysayers who really, you know, find him as a great threat in that sense. Because it's, it's simply, you know, the Malay, we have a saying, tak kenal maka tak cinta. Yeah. I think you just need to know to get to know the man better because sure. his contribution, I mean, amazing. He really, you know, in the hall of fame of Muslim scholars, you know, Imam Asafadi, right? He's, this is one of the great Muslim scholars, actually. You know, he, he put Al-Ghazali up in the Hall of Fame of all the Muslim scholars. And he said that he was the one who basically a great harmonizer who, who, who reconciled both science and religion. Yeah. Right? Something that Thomas Aquinas, Maimonides later benefited. And Imam Suyuti, another great, this is a great Shafi scholar, he said that, you know, Lao in Arabic, Lao means hypothetical if. It can never happen. Right? It's not the if in English or the Arabic in or either shartia we say in Arabic, but this is hypothetically only. Lau kana nabi the nabi, right? It would be him in Arabic. If were there, but it would be impossible to be a prophet that would come after, hmm. right? Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It would be Imam Al Ghazali. This is Imam Suyuti. Now you're not going to call Imam Suyuti misguided. I mean, he wouldn't say that. I mean, mm. because Imam Al Ghazali was a polymath. They were mutafannin. Uh, uh, you know, well, well versed in almost every discipline in the Islamic sciences. But also, he read the so-called worldly sciences. You know, Aristotle and the rest. You know. I mean, I, I just wanted to maybe round this section off so that it's not too tacti oh, technical I'm sorry, for, yeah, for yeah, our, our, our viewers and our listeners. But yes. Yes. I would maybe sort of try to describe this part of, of 
Al Ghazali's thinking after he went away, he came back. Mm. He had to challenge, and at this point in time, if you correct me if I'm wrong, there was an assault mm. against theology and religion by those who are more philosophically minded, mm. using logic. Mm. And Al Ghazali took it upon himself, not so much to refute the methodology, but to refute the conclusion. Absolutely of the world having a, a finite uh, starting point, right. of there being a logic to all of this. Right. But using that framework of Aristotle, saying, okay, I'm going to come into your ring right. and debate right. using your framework right. and prove the existence of an eternal God, right. using right. eternal God, Allah, right. using that framework. That's what he did, right? I mean, he, he, yeah. stopped, he stopped that philosophical assault against... Uh, theology and religion. A exactly, to the point where Khairi and Sharil, that he even, unfortunately, got even the reputation after that battle. There are Orientalist, uh, non-Muslim scholars, and even, you know, people who do not really properly know Al-Ghazali well, including Muslims, who then accuse Al-Ghazali as being the one who dealt the, the death blow to philosophy and science in Islam because of this, you know? Uh, I mean, he wrote the Tahaf al-Falasifa, this is the work, the incoherence of the philosophers where he attacked, you know, basically philosophy, but he only attacked those problematic conclusions right. from the Aristotelian tradition. Yes. And it's not just Aristotelian tradition, it was really more Avicenna in this case, Ibn Sina, yes. somebody whom he benefited a lot from, by the way. That's right. But 20 on 20 questions, mm. there are thousands of questions and these are the ones that he rejected because why? He said that this contradicts the basic tenets of Islam. But to really answer your question there, Khairi, essentially Al-Ghazali was a very wily fox, a great genius here. Why? Because as Khairi you know, puts it quite rightly, he used the tools of his enemies as a tool and precisely that as a tool. Did you know so Imam al-Ghazali came up from this madrasa called the Nizamiya. This is one of the first universities in the world, by the way. You know, Al-Azhar in those days, you know, in Egypt. He was Persian, The Karawin, of course, in Morocco today. But yeah. the, the Nizamiya were in Persia, in, yeah. in, 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 in Iran today, and in Baghdad as well. So the, 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 his wise and generous patron was Nizam al-Mulk, the prime minister of, of, of the land. Uh, the Sultan was Sultan Malik Shah and the Caliph was uh, Al-Mustazhiri. And, and during that time, they founded these first universities, you know, and George Magdisi, a, a great uh, Orientalist scholar, wrote this wonderful book called Rise of the, Co the Rise of Colleges. You can read more about it there. But it's interesting that when Al-Ghazali grew up in this madrasa tradition, there are certain sciences you're not supposed to kind of, or they don't teach, like, for example, logic, like mantik. So it was Al-Ghazali as one of the ulama, you know, who dabbled in the sciences. You know, started reading astronomy, started reading chemistry, physics, you know, not food science, but something like that. Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> going beyond of his comfort zone, when other people like you were saying earlier, like your friends were, oh, be careful of Al-Ghazali, you know, because he is quite maybe misguided. Even when everybody accepts him, maybe the one who is saying it actually is a reflection more on the one who is criticizing him anyway. But... Al-Ghazali was actually in that climate where people are saying, don't go read Aristotle. He's you know, not even from the Muslim world. And of course, this is well before the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, right? But he went on to read him. And you know what happened? Because of Imam Al-Ghazali, there was a paradigm shift. He openly advocated the teaching of these rational sciences in the madrasa. The sciences, for the first time, was then taught in the madrasa in the Middle Ages. This is one of the reasons why we have the golden age indeed as well. I mean, in, in, before Al-Ghazali, the sciences were more of a, a private enterprise of scholars like Ibn Sina, Avicenna, mm -hmm. who were patronized by the kings, by the sultans, by the, by the caliphs, you know, by the khalifas. But that is only a court activity. It, wasn't a, it was not institutionalized. But the thing about madrasa, it's important. I mean, it's a university or school. You institutionalize it. You put it into the syllabus. And then you teach generations of people for hundreds of years to come. And that is one of the great jasser, the great, as the Malaysia jasser, the great contribution of Imam al-Ghazali. Well, we I mean, can discuss yeah. whether that tradition has gone now because uh, there can be a case, uh, <laughs> the, we, we, you can make a case where that kind of um, integration of, of the Science and sciences religion. and the logical sciences yeah. has gone from the tradition of uh, teaching <laughs> in the Muslim world. But before that, um, just to end this segment, we're going to take a break. Can I just add after, after your point? A bit sure, here, sure. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, plug your book, oh, your hmm. latest book. And I was there for the royal launch of this the, book the several book months launch, ago my God, in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, by yeah. the deputy king of Malaysia, Sultan uh, Nazrin. 
uh, Shah, uh, and that was um, the launch of Islam and Biomedicine, which Afifi was uh, the principal editor together with Asim Padella. Yeah, a medic uh, and a theologian. So yeah, so yeah. this this is a book uh, that looks at, at the intersection between Islamic theology and uh, sciences. And I wanted to read one line, which perhaps encapsulates the entire discussion that we've been having, Al-Ghazali expresses this paradox best for us. And, and this paradox is what I think we were referring to just now when he described reveal knowledge, which is um, religion, Isla religion. Islamic knowledge or yeah. religious knowledge revealed by God as an intellect akal from outside of this world. Mm. So that's his first principle. It's, an, it's, it's a knowledge from outside. You, you would not understand the logical basis yeah. for this in the first place. And scientific knowledge as scripture from within ourselves. Yeah. I think that's a perfect way of uh, explaining this yeah. so-called paradox. And if yeah. you accept that, then things are quite clear. Cheryl? Yeah, yeah, I think just to wrap this section up and also anticipate presumably our, our discussion after this, I think that quote that uh, KJ just read from your book is the straddling right. of both logic, the balancing. Yeah. The balancing, balancing of that and, and also revealed knowledge that yeah. maybe begins to explain why until today, uh, despite what you've just described, there will be people, especially non-Muslims and Orientalists, as you pointed out earlier, who see Imam al-Ghazali not as the person who institutionalized rational sciences within madrasas mm. or, or made it something that was uh, a practice of all Muslims, mm. but actually as the person who introduced a new era in which Islam and the sciences were seen as incompatible. Yeah. So maybe right. as a final remark of this section, how do you and other scholars like you begin to break that myth uh, so that future generations begin to appreciate Al-Ghazali more wholly and more fairly? Yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, it's a very clever quote of Al-Ghazali and you can see it's a very profound one. I mean, the Arabic is even poetic, you know? You know, <laughs> an naklu which is whatever is transmitted science, like religion, scriptures, the Quran, the Hadith, for example, is an aklun min kharij. So, so our religion, knowledge of our religion is basically like an intellect from without. And it's interesting the way he said it, because in my, you know, I'm giving you a commentary of it. This is very Aristotelian. Because Aristotle said something about the nos poeticos, uh, or, or nos surathen, sorry, the, 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 basically the active intellect. And this is a bit technical, mm. but Al-Ghazali's point is that religious knowledge is alien to all of us. Yeah. It comes from outside of us. Mm. So, and sometimes we can't even understand it, right? Why do we pray five times a day? And why is it that in a day, Subo is two rakat, uh, Zohar is four, Asar is four, Maghrib is three rakat, and then Isha is four, a total of 17. Why 17, not 18, not 16, right? So this is Al-Ghazali's point. Then, then he goes on to say, but, our akal, our common sense, our reason, al aklu naklun min dakhilin. Our reason is a bit like a scripture, def, a bit like a scripture from within ourselves, meaning it is an authority as well, from within our, 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 our fitrah. So here, Imam al Ghazali is in fact commenting on the most famous verse in the Quran, that verse of light, Nurun ala nur. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there is light supervening or making strong the other line. So Al-Ghazali is trying to say here, this is the light of religion supporting the light of science or the light of science or akal supporting the light of scripture or religion in that sense. So you need both so that the two are in harmony with each other. And this is the way we should, you know, as Muslims, not just scholars, see the world as it is, that we shouldn't laga laga kan. This is another, another Malay wisdom word, you know. We shouldn't, uh, you know, a, a pit, these two opposite ends uh, against each other because it is to our detriment if we do so. So it's an amazing, profound saying of Al-Ghazali. And you can imagine why other equally geniuses like Maimonides or Thomas Aquinas from outside of our own religion, wow, was you know, really affected by Al-Ghazali. And you can even imagine his own adversaries, whether they are the, the Shias, the Mu'tazilas, the most, you know, it's kind of, you know, on the left, you know, the, 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 or even on the right, the, the, the Zahiris, you know, the literal minded mm -hmm. Muslims, for instance, they all, you know, his nemesis is said to be Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. 
Yeah. Now, Al-Ghazali is Hujatul Islam. Yeah. Al-Ghazali, this is Sheikhul Islam. So I'm giving the right. title Sheikhul Islam even mm-hmm. Taymiyyah. This, this great Hanbali scholar who was a great nemesis. Mm-hmm. You know, but he he belonged to that very literally school that gave birth later on to another uh, you know tradition of course in the modern world some call you know you know wahhabism or something yeah. you know it's another story that but so even he the great nemesis the great adversary of al-ghazali who came 100 years a couple of hundred years after al-ghazali had this grudging respect for the man yep. i mean you know what can you say i mean amazing really The Muslim women produce such great, you know. I mean, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah is a bit like the Martin Luther of Islam. <laughs> so <in> the, <laughs> Al-Ghazali is technically the Thomas Aquinas of yeah. Islam. I mean, we may agree to disagree with that, but there you go. Okay. Wonderful. We will uh, take a quick break and come back uh, with uh, Sheikh Afifi. Welcome back to an illuminating episode of Kindred Stories with Dato Dr. Afifi Al-Akiti, who is the Kuwait Fellow at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies and Lecturer in Islamic Studies at the Faculty of Theology, Oxford, as well as a Fellow of Worcester College, Oxford, where he's an expert of both Islam and Christianity. Afifi, we had a wonderful discussion about Al-Ghazali. Uh, we tried to make it as accessible as possible. I think the summary from that is how we try to reconcile the sciences with uh, revealed knowledge and um, Al-Ghazali's pivotal role in that, in the Islamic tradition. I want to shift towards your role as somebody who is teaching in Oxford and you teach both scholars and also people who are will have a career in divinity. Right. You, I'm sure you teach uh, mm-hmm. future priests mm-hmm. uh, in the Christian tradition. Um, you know a lot about, of course, Islam, but also about Christianity. But to take a step back out of the theology and make it the conversation that we're having much more accessible, What do you think of multiculturalism? What do you think of how Christians and the West view Islam today? Mm. And I say this in the context where there is still a lot of misunderstanding. Although since 2001, I would say that the West's attempts at understanding Islam has grown but it's still a problem. You still have this rise of identity politics in the West where immigration is a big issue in right. elections right. in the UK and in the US. But you know that part of that subtext mm. is against Muslims and Islam. You don't, they don't have right. to say it. It's a dog whistle. Mm. So what is your view on all of this? Well, Harry, one, one of the things I benefited from being in Oxford is that we meet all sorts of scholars at the university and, you know, in a college especially, it's multidisciplinary. I may be a theologian or a philosopher, but then you sit with historians, political scientists and economists. Uh, and one of the things I learned from a political scientist there, and, you know, it's mentioned that we live in an age where there is effective polarization. Now, this is effective as in A-F-F-C-E-C-T-I-V, right? You know, you play with your emotions. You 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 get polarized because of heated feelings. Uh, you know, as opposed to issues polarization. And this is very interesting. How even politically the world at mm. large, and we see the rise of uh, nationalist populism on the one hand. You know, we see Trump, the rise of Trump, Bolsonaro, of course, in Brazil. Um, Brexit. Even, you know, Brexit, of course, uh, in in the UK, and even arguably even the Muslim world. You know, Erdogan actually. Modi, of course, in India. So these are all examples of nationalist populism on the rise, and sometimes with heady mix with with, with religion. So um, and 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 it's dangerous when you actually play with feelings because when you play with feelings, the danger is that you can end up killing someone. And if it's just an issue uh, polarization, and I hope you know Malaysia never goes <laughs> there to effective polarization full on. I mean, it's really when you only debate the policies. Hmm. And, and and this is something I benefited from being, you know, so you, you hear these other scholars talking about this and then I thought about it, you know, really what we, are un, what we are going through today globally, not just in the UK, perhaps even in Malaysia and in other parts of the world, certainly almost globally, is you know, there are cultural wars going on now. 
Now people are talking about the different values. And and that is the expectation that certain values are to be imposed on other countries and things like that. And then and vice versa. So I think first, you know, you know, I think we need to be clear. I think we we are living in that climate. So it can be quite difficult with with populist politicians out there. Right. So it 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 it, it can be something which you know we would be disheartening. And I think so. I mean, I I I would I would I would think that if we if we have to go through that, you will be the victims. Now, as a Muslim who lives in the West, we are the victims because we are the minorities. So imagine if you are in Malaysia where you are the majority, you will have the minorities there in here in Malaysia, for example, and maybe they might even feel the same way if, you know, we have this full-on kind of nationalism, you know, this, this, this religious populism. So this is something we have to be very careful of. Really, we do. I mean, we, 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 we must be responsible for not making things worse. We must not add fuel to fire. And even when we in the does West... That, yeah. Does that mean for a Muslim in the West to just assimilate and lose all their... Certainly not. Muslim identity, not. not add fuel to fire, don't wear the hijab. No, 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 certainly not. And, and one, of, one of the most wonderful things about living in Oxford in the United Kingdom, as opposed to, say, the rest of Europe, and certainly the UK is now out of Europe, trying Brexit, is that they really, really give you that freedom. Alhamdulillah. And you do not even actually... I have to, I have to, I have to confess, I, I don't really feel kind of under siege, but I do have friends who live in France, for example, because of the new laws that have come up with, you know, proscri- you know basically prohibiting, proscribing the, uh, uh, the hijab. Uh, uh, and, and people feel really under siege, unfortunately. I mean, the, my, the lesson here is that it, it should be laser fair. <laughs> you know, it should not be the, the role of, in this case, you know, governments to either proscribe or prescribe. Just look at the example of Iran and, and, and Turkey or France now. I mean, Turkey, it used to be the case once upon a time where they forbade the wearing of hijab, the, 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 the Muslim women uh, headwear. And you know, the counterculture is besides people go to protest to wear the hijab to try and get into universities, mm. right? And look at what's happening in Iran today, the Masa Amini case, because they prescribe the wearing of it. Then if you don't, they, again, the counterculture is you, you, you protest, you take it off. So I think, again, listen to Imam al-Ghazali here. Imam al-Ghazali says what? Ishma shita fa'inna kamayid. Live as you please for you will die anyway. <laughs> A very clear kind of open value there. But you need to have that personal responsibility to manage this, you see? So... That, that's where yeah. Cheryl comes. You have to be careful with Imam Ghazali. <laughs> Live as you please. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's where it came from uh, when they told me that. But doctor, maybe... I, I hope... You know, you love me, Mama Ghazali. No, no, I, I definitely did. I, <laughs> I could to, your point about, to your point about protesting, the more yeah. people told me don't go there, I went there. Exactly, <laughs> so exactly was, right? It, it, the rules are, some people say rules are meant to be broken. Sure. The exactly, of, you know, especially when you're a teenager and, and rebellious and, and all the rest right? of it. Doctor, I think we'll, we'll, we'll go back to Malaysia. We'll come back to Malaysia later and our role right. as the majority community. I've always felt that the way I identify with Islam politically is uh, that we, because we are in a majority in this country, we ought to be compassionate and I, I care more about that. But when speaking to, about Islam from the perspective of someone who lives in the West, mm. I think I flipped the other way, which is that, sure, I, 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 I've been on record saying we need integration, we need, you know, people need to integrate within the majority community and all the rest of it. But um, to develop KJ's point earlier, Surely it's not about losing one's identity. Mm. Surely it's about also asserting and not being embarrassed in any way yep. about your Muslimness. I wanted to get some commentary from you. In the 21st century, what does that mean? How do you assert Muslimness in Britain? Right. Or in the, in this the West? Is a, you know, it's an excellent point brought up by the two of you because the, the, the most basic way I can break it down is when you ask the question, are you Muslim first? Or are you British first? Are you, you know, you know this question, are mm. you... Are you you know, if you're a British, I'm, which I'm not, by the way, I'm a Malaysian citizen, alhamdulillah. You, you're sure, yeah? <laughs> uh, of course, absolutely. <laughs> have been offered a couple of times, but uh, I, I refused and, and, and proudly, you know, carry my Malaysian passport. Of course, you know, why would you want to throw away a Malaysian passport? Wonderful, the, wonderful. You know, the best country place in, in the world for you to live in, and particularly expats it, say yeah. that, you know, wonderful food, right? Uh, anyway, the thing is, 
when we have this polarization, this effective polarization, which I referred to earlier, yes, this this sort of polarization that Al Ghazali, for example, tried to harmonize. You know, don't pit between science and religion. Don't pit between your Britishness and your Islamness. Don't pit even between your Malaysianness or your Islamness, for that matter. Because yeah, I mean, you have multiple identities actually in that sense. You know, you know, your religion is Islam. Uh, if you happen to be a citizen of a country, that is your allegiance to that country, whichever country that may be in. And then, and this is the bit where you have to learn, unlike others who try to polarize things, that these are things that, you know, as Al Ghazali puts it, you, you know, that can be in harmony with each other. There is no need for you to think that they are not in harmony with each other. And I think this is where we remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, particularly, you know, in Surah Al Hujurat, you know, verse 13, right? وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُ right? It's a beautiful verse that we have made you into basically races and religion. To get to know one another. To get to know one another. And the irony here is, and the Malay translation is the best one here. It says, Supaya kita dapat kenal, berkenalan satu sama lain. Untuk apa? Supaya kita berbaik untuk kita suka. And you know, so that you get Translate to, that into English. Yeah, so, so we say that in English, so, so that you get to know one another. Why do you want to get to know one another in Malay when you say kenalan? Because you want to get married, you know, you want to love each other. Because that's the whole point that you want to be get friends. to know each other. Yeah. Be friends. The default setting is to be friends. What's the point of berkenalan dengan orang? Hmm. You know, bertunang, sorry, you wanted to get engaged with someone maybe or you want to start a family or just to be friends. So the point of the verse is lita arofu here so that you become friends if not family. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created different people. This is the point of the verse. And that's a very beautiful ethic, by the way, which is taught by the Islamic religion, which which made the Islamic religion once upon a time, Khairi, during our so-called golden age, back in the time of Al-Ghazali and the rest, where they used to rule the world. And that they were the first world, while Europe, UK, Oxford was the third world. I'm going to go in there and ask a basic question. Lita Arafu get to know one another amongst the community of believers or with those who don't believe as well? Absolutely, including those who don't believe as well. A. E. That's human the being. point. A. E. Human being. Right? Human being. And, and why? Because the verse starts off with, you know, this is one of the few places in the Quran where it doesn't say, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. It says, Ya ayyuhal nas. Mm. All Allah mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically addressing all mankind, the, 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 the children of Adam, Bani Adam, not just the Muslims. That's it. And this is the point, right? It's a very powerful verse. It, you see, because of this verse, we have a lot of things that came out of this, by the way. Very interesting verse. It is from here, this verse, that we learn the tradition that we take for granted in the West today that they assume this is a Western value to agree to disagree. Right to live and not live. Uh, how do you, how do we say this in the, the Malaysian context? You know, a double ikhtilaf, right? You have the you learn to to to, have, to agree differences. among ourselves. You know, <laughs> the ethic of disagreement. Yeah. You know, one of the most beautiful sayings from a, of a great Muslim scholar. His name mm. is Ash Shafi'i, of course, the great founder of the one of the four schools of the Sunni law. And he said, you know, like this. You know, he said, "Madhabi sawabun yahtamilul khata." I believe my view on a particular question that I've researched on to be correct with the possibility of it being wrong. Mm. While the opposing view of madhab al-akhar, khata, yahtamilu sawab. While the possibility of the, uh, while, while the view of the other that contradicts me, mm. my view here to be wrong with the possibility of it being right. Mashallah, yeah. what a great gentleman here. It's this ethic of disagreement that, mm. you know, my friends, you know, in Oxford who teaches Christian, uh, a theology, Christian history, people like, you know, uh, uh, Professor McDermott and others, you know, who's written big books, you know, on, on history of Christianity. They, they say to me, they admire the Muslim tradition. And I ask, why? It's this. It's this ethic of disagreement because how is it that you can have, they don't understand. You know, how is it that you can actually have four churches, either four madhabs, hmm. but they can all be orthodox at the same time. They can all be equally correct. And, you know, orthodox means that, you know, from a Christian standpoint, right, only you, that one madhab, that one school, is the only right one. The others cannot, like the, the Protestants, the Catholics, they fight with each other in those days. No longer today, of course, because they never had that ethic of disagreements then, but now they do, you see. But this is something, we started off with that. That's why we used to rule the world. This is the point. We, we were the kind of, you know, the land of the free. Because in the Abbasid Empire, uh, next door to the Roman Byzantine Empire, we, we can build not only mosques, certainly, of course, but churches, synagogues, temples, but next door, in Constantinople, they can't even build synagogues. Or let alone, 
churches belong to different madhab in their tradition. Forget about mosques. So they didn't have freedom of religion. We have freedom of religion. So this is a value which we, the Muslim civilization, taught the rest of the world. Lakum dinukum waliyadi. The Quran says, you know, your religion is your religion. My religion is my religion. You have freedom of religion. You can practice your religion. And so, and 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 so, this is all part of that learning to litaarafu, learning to agree to disagree, learning to know each other. And look at Ashafi when he said that, we now take for granted in Britain. This this quality of live and let live, not a James Bond movie, but you know, yeah. to agree to disagree, mm-hmm. right? So, but uh, we now Muslims are lacking this uh, very quality, unfortunately. Afifi, I was just about to go there. Right? Do we lack this ethics of disagreement, live and let live, uh, agreeably disagreeing? Has that become? I mean, this this image of Islam as very literalist, very rigid. Mm. Not allowing for a multitude Opposing of views, yeah. of views. Right. is that an Orientalist trope, or is it actually happening in the Muslim yeah. world that is so rigid? Unfortunately, Doctor, if I can yeah. tag on to that as well. Right. Um, I think we haven't completed our discussion about Islam in the West, and that's right. one particular point right. that that managing our differences, right? Still, within the context of managing differences within the Islamic thought and within the Muslim community, right. how then does a Muslim community in a place like where you live assert its identity? So, very simply, I think really to answer both of your questions here, this is where in in my teaching to particularly the undergraduates, the freshers, right? The, my te- lectures are usually titled Understanding Islam and the Muslims, by the way. So I always say and explain to them, understanding Islam is one thing, the theory, but understanding Muslims is quite another, the practice. And that's why we find, interestingly, you know, great scholars like Imam Tahtawi, right? Uh, Rifa'a Tahtawi during the 19th century when Muhammad Ali Pasha ruled Egypt just after the invasion of Napoleon uh, in 1792. <laughs> you know, he, re- he then realized, Tahtawi realized he needs to up you know, the, the knowledge on, 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 on the sciences and military technology. And all. So he sent his imams along with the uh, regiment of the Egyptian army to kind of be trained in, in Paris. So when Tata, we went to Paris, he said, Wajatul Islam, you know, Phil Faransa. When I went there, I discovered Islam is in Paris, in France, in the West, Bighayri Muslimin, but there are no Muslims here. Wa rajatu ila baitin. When I went back home to Egypt, you know, Wajatul Muslimin Bighayri Islam. I found Muslims, but I don't see Islam, the true values of Islam. This is a very important lesson. It means Sharia. The point is you just have to learn to act on what you know. You just have to act on what you know. I mean, if you don't practice your religion, this is what will happen. If you don't act on what you really know, I mean, you know, you, you think of the Japanese, for example. Can you imagine it? We believe as Muslims, right? At-Tahar, you know, this is Shatrul Iman, right? They, that purity, or purification is half, is a part of our faith, part of our Iman. Yet we can see how the 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 the, the state of the nation's toilets, you know, that I hear that the Malaysian Prime Minister in Malaysia recently had to kind of do a national policy program just to clean up the the the, the, the nation's toilets, something like that. You go to Japan, this is like you you see you see Islam there, but no Muslims there. Meaning, you know, they're so clean the toilets you can even sleep in them. So it's a lesson of when we don't practice what we preach, this is what will happen to us in that sense. And the good thing about being in the West is that they do give you that freedom of being able to actually practice, except for in some of the other parts we mentioned, France, for example, at least the UK, they do. And I think this is where we must never take our freedoms for granted. We must never, never, ever do that. And and this, this is where living in the West, it has its challenges. But I believe through these challenges, just like Imam al-Ghazali, just like Dekar, you know, all these other great people in the history of mankind, it actually increases their faith with the, with the challenges they go through. It will make you a much more versatile person when you are being tested in this. So I think, it, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, I think, in that sense. So I think it, it, it's, a, it's a good lesson from not just our religion, but from history as well, I think, in that sense, you know. So Islam projects always a very positive message really on that. And I think... It's amazing that, wow, you know, the West really, uh, you know, they have, they vaunt, they, they talk about this ethics of dis- disagreement. This is why, I, I mean, just to round this off, you know, my, my Christian professors in France were saying they, were, they admire this. Wow, uh, how can you have four orthodox schools that each one of them are right, meaning orthodoxy, 
orta, you know, from the Latin meaning, you know, uh, correct, doxa meaning belief, you got the right belief, but four schools, four mazhab can be right. Surely, you know, it's oxymoronic from a Christian standpoint. I, I jokingly say that, it's true. So this is why we really have to be humble here and we realize, hmm, never take for granted our freedoms, really, whether you are in the UK or whether you are in Malaysia. And this is where if you end up being the one who oppresses others, you know, there is what others in other religion call karma or what we say, you know, karma tadi nutudan, right? You have to be careful because it may come back to bite you in a way that you never expected. Uh, Afifi, you have been very clear, but also kind about living as a Muslim in the West. I want to bring the discussion to something that is troubling a lot of Muslims around the world today. Mm. And that's the genocide in Gaza. Sure. And while there are many lessons to be learned from the West about freedom, about the ethics of disagreement, but I think it would be remiss for us not to talk about Western hypocrisy in the face of what is happening yep. in Gaza today. Of course, the perpetrators here are the Israelis, the regime in Tel Aviv, but it's very clear that they receive support, moral support, political support, even military and financial support. Political cover. From mm-hmm. countries in the West, yep. in particular the United States and the UK. Yep. Now, how do you as a Muslim living in the West, speaking about all the positive values of the Western tradition Mm. that you have just spoken about, Mm. reconcile that with this geopolitical hypocrisy that's taking place in uh, over Gaza? Thank you. So Khairi is like, we are in the tutorial, you're the tutor now. I, mean, I have to answer you, you know, no. give, give the essay, you know, 2,000 words argument. Now. For the, now, exactly. Absolutely, Khairi. I mean, it, 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 it's one of the things where, first of all, I think, you know, when you, when you live in the West and you also realize in the UK, but particularly in the United States where I don't live there, but I hear and we see and friends who do say, and this is where we do need to distinguish between when we say, particularly when the very sensitive question on Israel and on Judaism, that we need to separate the two. I think it's very important. And you will be surprised, highly, that, you know, uh, if the marches that are going on in Western capitals, especially, there are placards and Jews who demonstrate against the war, Jews against, you know, genocide, Jews against, you know, Israel, for example. And, and you'll be surprised that the younger generation particularly, Jewish friends and so on and so forth, they, they find whatever is happening there in our Holy Land is appalling. I mean, it, it is appalling. Enough, but of course, this is not to gloss over the fact that I think, and this is where, you know, the moral high ground of the West has been shattered because of this. You know, Joseph Borrell, the high representative of the European Union, he's a bit, he's a bit like the foreign minister of Europe, I mean, two years ago, who would have thought? You know, two years ago, he was panned for saying what? He, was, he said, Europe is a garden. The rest is jungle. While the rest of the world, for, for the most part of the rest of the world, is a jungle. So I mean, Western trope. It was a Western trope, right? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, but although he, he's a lefty politician, right, from Spain. The mask slipped. I mean, well, okay. But, he, but to be fair to him, he apologized. Yeah. And then he tried to explain himself and he said, look, this is in the context why people wanted to go to, to Europe. I, you know, the, the sense that there is more, better civilization right, there, right. better system. So, wow. You right. know, okay. So anyway, he apologized two years ago. But look, since October the 7th, because whatever happened is wrong, absolutely. I mean, you know, it is inexcusable. Uh, you know, we can't, two wrongs do not make a right. For us, for the Palestinians, for the Muslims, but equally for the Israelis as well. Their government there as well. You know, two wrongs cannot make a right. But since 7th of October, you see Joseph Burrell, whenever he speaks, people who listen to him, you think, has he converted or what? You know, he completely, you know, I mean, you, you can hear... He, you know, he, he, you know, it's a very different perspective than sort of, you know, from say Ursula von der Leyen, you know. So, so when he speaks, 
people in the global south, for example, the rest of the world, the people whom he accused of being like in the jungle, actually think that what he says actually makes sense, for instance. So, and, and why? And, and this is because of the Gaza war. And so it's amazing that even he can actually shift his position that, that, you know, that he realized that Europe and indeed the West, the US, the global North is fast losing their moral high ground because of this. And, and you know, and, and he is now basically asking, you know, advocating the fact that we should be engaging with the global South in, in, in interesting ways and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so he is an example, I think, of where there is a crisis of morality, of, of ethics in that sense from the Western nations because, you know, if you're hypocritical, how can you actually start, uh, you know, preach other nations that you should do this or that? Mm. But, you know, having said this, right, having said this, and I think it's good that Joseph Borrell is basically saying this, you know, I mean, he's basically asking for immediate ceasefire now, you know, so we know that the Security Council, for example, has finally, uh, you know, finally reached that point. Um, but we must also not forget, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is all about, the lesson here, the theological lesson is about two wrongs do not make a right. How do we say this in, in Malay, right? Uh, halal tak menghalakan cara, is it? Or, matlamat tak menghalakan cara. Matlamat tak menghalakan cara. Matlamat tak menghalakan cara. Something like that. Yeah, to, you know, the ends does not justify the means. Mm. Do you know that this is a very important Islamic value quality that comes out in the Quran itself when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fusilat, right? Good and evil are not the same thing. Repel what is evil with something better. Right? You know, Amazing verse of the Quran. Because if you do that, if you don't fight fire with fire, if you don't try to break the rule of law in order to fight something, if you don't uh, make the ends justify the means, right? Because Good and evil are not equal, and you must fight with them. And not like in the Christian sense, you turn the other cheek. But here you, you fight, but with something better, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Then you will make your sworn enemy into a true and faithful friend. This is a verse of the Quran. So, yeah. and I will say this. So, the meaning here is, and I, and, and I know, I mean, uh, years ago when, you know, my so-called, <laughs> they say, claim to fame is to have written the fatwa against suicide bombing. Up to 2005. You know, 7, 7, 2005. Yeah. Right, I, even while I was a student, I became famous because of that, you know, before even becoming a, a, a lecturer at the university. And then and, and the basic point was simply to assert from an Islamic legal standpoint, you know, that yes, if we want to fight, we need to fight with proper ethics and morality correctly according to our rule of law. But Dr. So I, my, my, you know, less people misunderstand hmm. the message of my work, for example, on this, but more importantly, less people misunderstand when we say that we need to be able to kind of, uh, uh, you know, fight according to the rule of law, to have sabar, to have patience, and to have tawakkul, to, to trust in God, you see, it's not the same thing as meek submission. It's not the same thing as, you know, the Christian but telling I'm, I'm, the other I'm having a problem there, Shara, just yeah. before you come in, I, I just wanted to raise this point. I'm having a big problem with Sabar when it comes to Gaza. Mm. I think this is the greatest evil in our lifetime sure. that we are witnessing. And I, I'm having a big problem about how to deal with the West now, um, Afifi. I, I studied in the West. I know the Western tradition. Mm. But... I can't bring, I mean, a, a rational person like myself has yep. been reduced to very, very dark, angry thoughts against the West. To the extent now that I don't interact with Western diplomats in, in Malaysia, I've, I've oh received dear. invitations and I've just basically told them to bugger <laughs> off because I just don't <laughs> want to it deal with any Western person right now. Right. And if somebody like me can have these very, very dark Strong thoughts feelings, and yeah. anger and have problem with sabar, as you mentioned just now, yes. what more? Right. What more? Somebody who right. can be radicalized on this. Understood. I, I, Understood. How do I deal with so, this? Okay, how do you deal with that? This is really when you need to have faith, right? This is really when you need to have your religion to help you out with. And I happen to be a religious scholar, so a bit of... I wouldn't say advice, this is more for myself. <laughs> I, I struggle with this. Every day you see on screen, I don't have social media, but we see it on the news and you cry. 
I mean, this is so inhuman. You, you dehumanize, they dehumanize us basically. And this is a terrible thing, right? But then I tell myself that I must never, never, just because of this, you break the law. Never because of this, then, you know, you end up resorting to something which is wrong, right? And the lesson is this, to have sabr, to have patience, and to have tawakul, in God we trust, as the dollar bill says, right? to have tawakul, right? It's not the same thing as meek submission, M-E-E-K. Not the same thing as turning the other cheek. As a, that's a Christian belief. We are not like that. The Quran says, ahsan. Repel with what is even better. Now you have to be creative what is meant by better here. This is the point. So to have sabr, to have patience and to trust in God is not the same thing as make submission. No one is saying do nothing. But nor can we do just about anything. And this is the point. And the right to self-defense, and this is for both the Israelis as well as the, basically, this is, this is a lesson for the Israelis, yeah? and also our, for our, our side, the Palestinians. Well. The right to self-defense and the right to self-determination is not carte blanche for any of us to go against our legal precedents and for Muslims to go against the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Very clear. We have a clear moral high ground on this. Even if the other side, even if the enemy stoops to illegitimate means, every legitimate means must be pursued in order to further the Palestinian cause. Just as the Muslims did during the time of Salahuddin al Ayyubi, during the time of Saladin. That is how you will get victory. Doctor, I really truly believe in that. And not just me, but all the other great Muslim ulama that you fight with the rule of law on this, but you are right. So the, the West in this sense have lost their moral high ground. So, but that is, they will have to suffer the consequence. The, in Arabic, we say the akiba of that, the repugnant consequence of that. But let us not, we, the ummah, you know, as a result, resort to, and alhamdulillah, so far we haven't, and which is very good. And even, you know, those who are basically, you know, in the midst of all this, they have been the one who have been oppressed, of course, but they do, I mean, their dignity, look at this Gaza, war, this tragedy, more people are now reading the Quran, buying the Quran in the West as a result of it. People who have never, I mean, it's a bit like 9-11 all over again in that sense. Can you imagine? There are wisdom, there are hikmah that happens be, be, beyond that we can't sometimes see. But as a Muslim theologian, as a Muslim scholar, as a person of faith, you know, we obviously need to make sure that when we do fight on this, we do fight correctly, justly. We do not stoop using illegitimate means just because the other side are doing that. And it's good. It's for the history to record that whatever is happening, this is a real game changer. I think it's, you know, in another forum recently here in the sort of Oxford forum at Sunway University in Malaysia, right? I mean, rising tides, geopolitics and geoeconomics in a global context. And this is one of those big, big, you know, realignment that we are probably will be seeing in geopolitics, you know, where because of the Gaza war, you have really, you know, Western nations breaking up, uh, you know, scurrying their hair, trying to figure out what to do on this, the rise of the BRICS, for instance, particularly on this. And even you have a rather unexpected kind of unity of the Muslim world, mm. Iran and Saudi Arabia, for example, mm. coming together. So, mm. You know, subhanAllah, I mean, mm. it, it's one of those things. Sorry, Shari, but yeah. yeah. No, no, love to hear that. But a couple of things to unpack, Doctor. One, uh, your point, you mentioned a few times about repelling with something better. Yeah. But I love the fact that you recognize that this is as, Quranic, of, yeah. as of today, mm. as of today, nobody is complaining that Muslims are reacting in a wrong way. So yeah. you, you established that. So we <laughs> appreciate that point, but it's not currently the problem that Muslims face. The mm -hmm. problem that Muslims face is how do we react and how do we defend um, the dignity of our faith and our our fellow Muslims. Yeah. Uh, but the second point, a more interesting point, Doctor, is when you say repel with something better, could it be that this something better we ought to strive for is how the Muslim Ummah and the Muslim political leadership can step up? Yeah. Because we can sit here for hours and complain about the West and complain about the hypocrisy of the West and we could do that. Mm -hmm. But maybe we should spend some time to talk yeah. about the meekness and the failures of Muslim political leadership. You 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 said just now about uh, how you know Iran and Saudi coming to terms, but that's that's basically mm -hmm. grasping at straws, doctor. The fact mm -hmm. of the matter is, we have never been unified in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. always been that we yeah. get you know 
easily shifted around right. for, for our own national interest. There isn't a sense of sticking together, standing up for what is right. There's always the sense of, you know, nation, national boundaries or different, uh, you know, personal political interests that are not clearly based on the deen, right? So, so I feel like maybe Muslims need to look inward first and maybe not try and seek validation or hope from the West. Certainly. But see what yeah. we can do with ourselves and our political Absolutely. leadership. Maybe yeah. any thoughts on that? Well, do you well, see a, a glory day, uh, yeah. glory days for Islam leadership right. coming back anytime soon? Well, well put the way you, you, you said it just now that to seek validation from others. And I think you really have to be self-sufficient. You have to start, it has to start from home. I mean, I think like Michael Jackson, we see man in the mirror. And we don't have muhasa, but you look at yourself and see the precisely the difficulty and the problem is precisely lies with us. Otherwise, this is not this will not happen. I mean, imagine now going back to the history of the Crusades. It's not something new in that sense as well. I mean, the first Crusade happened when that happened in ten. I can't remember the exact date, forty or something like that. You know, in the eleventh century, just oh, ten ninety something, just around the time of Al Ghazali, by the way. And when Jerusalem fell, you see what happened? So the Christians who basically invaded uh, Jerusalem by Tulmakdis, they basically raped and pillaged almost everyone, including the Christians who were there. But it took a slow 100 years for the Muslim world to wake up and rise up to the challenge when you have the rise of Saladin, almost 100 years later. So again, and then when Saladin came to reconquer Jerusalem, he did not do what the Christians did 100 mm. years earlier. Look, this is what I meant by that. Right? It's important that we need to keep on our moral high ground there. But you are right. This means that we are weak politically. This is our fault. We are not united enough. This is a political project, of course. And this is a question that rests on the laurels of our politicians. And it's important that they need to be able to kind of do something about it. Now, the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, you know, he's given us a path to this, right? Is a ra'a munkaran, you know, the Prophet said, peace be upon him, if you see something evil, a wrong munkar. doing, you know, munka, right, something wrong, then you should try and change it with your hands. You know, for if you mouth. can't change it with your hands, you do it with your tongue, and if you can't, and that is the, the lowest level of faith. Now, this is a very interesting way forward. I remember in a, in a, in a live interview, with the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Dr. Mahathir, very famous, the whole of the Muslim world knows him, of course, you know. And at that time also uh, the, uh, you know, in government, the, the Malaysian uh, ambassador to the Middle East, uh, I think Tan Sri Tok Guru Haji Awang, right? From the Islamic party. And I was, <laughs> I was the, the only non-politician there. And I remember that, that interview, uh, this was during the last Gaza uh, crisis. I think, was it a year ago, I think, wasn't it? So, yes, yes. Um, uh, 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 I laid out and uh, this, this, this plan that the Prophet had taught us. Look, it's very interesting. The Prophet taught us, if you see some wrongdoing, you need to change it with your hand. The meaning there is you change it militarily. So the, the reality is, can the Muslim world, the Muslim nation, next to uh, Israel, go into a state, you know, go into war, basically, Egypt? Jordan. I mean, if you know anything about <laughs> the state of the military affairs, uh, James, all this, you know, all, all the annual books, you say it's it's pitiful. Yeah. I don't want to say this on 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 live TV or anything like that. But there are even states where did you know the Egyptian army even having difficulty uh, having paratroopers mm. trying to jump out of airplanes? The state that we are in is so weak. Can you imagine it? Then you send the troops there, they will be decimated for sure. So, but we will have to continue to make dua that this is, this is the reason why Muslim nations must learn to be self-sufficient politically, militarily, economically, so that they can stand up for what is right and justice, of course, such as in this case. But if, because they are not able to, so we make dua, this is the jiran, Malaysia, forget about them. I mean, we, we, we're not even a jiran. We're far away from that. So, what have we got left to do? Is it other things other than sending a military help? There are other things mm. that you can do. I know that there are people who boycott BDS, boycott divestment and sanctions movement, which mm. is actually something which is done all over the world. And I give the example in that, in that forum of Ireland. Ireland is a country in the EU where I think they are doing much better things than what perhaps Malaysia is doing. I, you know, since we're talking about this, now you, you want to compare apple to oranges, we're very compared with Ireland. At least they have now put up a law in their own parliament to divest, 
investments in, you know, in the in Israeli companies. Are we doing this? They put this up in parliament for instance. They have a history of dispossession. They have. They know. They know. Yeah. And they are better still. And in the case of South Africa, who's actually brought, you know, Israel to court, for instance. Mm. But, but we Muslims must look at our policies, you know, in a country like Malaysia, for example, what more can we do? Rather than just talking, rather than just demonstrating, the government perhaps should look more seriously about, look at some of these things. And of course, you know, we, are, we have done, you know, some of the things that we do, you know, for instance, you, you, your, your passport is not even allowed to enter, you know, that country and so on and so forth, right? So I think, you know, some other the Arab countries, uh, they have, you know, so of course, very controversial. To be fair, so. I think the government's also um, denied uh, Israeli uh, flag uh, vessels to birth. Indeed. Um, in, in, yeah. in ports. Right, yep. right. So at least, you know, that, that is, I mean, so, so these are all examples where you're trying to stop using your hand whether militarily, whether through boycott, divestment and sanctions, for example, uh, you know, but whatever, however way you could interpret that, it's important you try and do it with your hands, yeah. right? Now, if you can't, at that point when you can't, you're not in government, like the rest of us, we are not in government. We, you know, we don't have the ability one day, inshallah, you know, Khairi, the prime minister of Malaysia, inshallah, you know, so, uh, you know, there, you know, I mean, there, 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 are, there are benefits and wisdom behind being in the years of wilderness, you know, because, you know, it makes you stronger, actually. But absolutely, one day when you are prime minister yourself, you must remember this. And I think this is the point about we need to enact policies and laws to make sure within the power that we have to try and change and make the world a, be a better place. So if we can't do that, if we are not in government, then the next thing we can do is advocacy. Fabilisani, then you speak. You know, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, you know, Afdalul Jihad, right? Kalimah to Hakin and the Sultan in Jair. The best form of jihad, the best form of struggle is to speak power to truth. Truth power. Sorry, <laughs> to speak truth to power. You know, to speak in front of a tyrannical ruler, the truth, basically. And so this is where you get the chance to, 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 to uh, campaign, to, you know, advocate, to write, and so on. But, even if you can't do that, and this is what we see in Malaysia, of course, at least you make the du'a. Yeah. You do your, your du'a, the, the kunut nazila, right, in Malaysia. You know, at least we're doing it. There are others who don't even do this. Yeah. But doctor, so you are need you not, to have that uh, are you, steps. Yeah. Are you still not frustrated that, especially the Arab world, if I can call that out, they are the ones signing up to the Abraham Accords. They are the ones who until today yeah. still have relations with the regime that are killing every day. Um, so that sense of frustration before we even go to, you know, Doha and all the rest of it, these yep. are people yep. in positions of power have the proximity yep. to the so, to the genocide to do something about it. Yep. Maybe not militarily, fine, I take yep. your point. But there are other tools geopolitically which they're clearly choosing not to use. No, I don't think anyone is disagreeing with you on this. And I think this is the point that if it took 100 years for there to be Saladin to, mm. you know, so we have to get our house in order, right? Absolutely, to rebuild our strength there. Eh? And maybe this is the beginning of it. You never know. I mean, yeah. I mean, they always say on this Gaza war, right? Things are not going to be the same after this. Well, sure. on both sides. And I think, and we pray and we make dua. And I think, wow, maybe this is where those Arab countries who have signed up their peace agreements with the, you know, with the state of Israel, for example, they must use this as leverage. Or at least they ought to use this as leverage, surely. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, but I'm not a politician. Yep. You, you know, you, you, you are Khairi, but you know, you are resting and you're on sabbatical at home, but one day and you, Sharil, you know, I mean, I believe you, you know, you are the sidekick, right? So one day, you <laughs> I know, don't know when you that. guys, <laughs> you guys get back in power, I mean, <laughs> you know, when, gonna you, think when, that clip when you and guys get yeah. back in power, wait for me, the, you know, who, uh, inshallah, who will never be a politician. I mean, so, you know, knock on the door, you know, and I can't be positioned, I've promised someone I can't be positioned, you know, knock on the door and say, so what are you doing about this? Come on, what are you doing about this? You know, yeah. so, but it's, it's, it's really where, you know, this is why we are all frightened about the test that God sets us. And it's easy to, of course, say this, but we can, you know, the best we can do now is advocacy, absolutely. We, if we have our friends in the Middle East there, this is the sort of thing we need to encourage people to up their technology, up their knowledge and up their capabilities, really. And it really just shows that, you know, we were no longer, of course, we are the third world now. I mean, we used to be the first world, so. Yeah. Um, we will take a break on that. And thank you for the advice. I can confirm very much that Charil is an equal partner now. <laughs> and, uh, uh, anything less. Um, but we will come back with the last segment where we want to talk about when Muslims are in the majority. 
I think we spent a lot of time speaking about when Muslims are in the minority in the West. But let's flip that for the last segment and so. talk about the situation where Muslims are in a majority and how we treat minorities. Uh, we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to uh, possibly one of the final segments of this episode of Kindred Stories with Dr. Afifi. Uh, thank you so much for your generosity in your time. Doctor, we've spent quite a bit of time uh, talking about Islam in the West, how to assert identity, how to manage differences in a position or from a position of relative weakness mm -hmm. or maybe a position of minority. Yeah. Uh, we are speaking obviously in Kuala Lumpur where that is not the case, where Islam and Muslims are the majority, where we hold political power, uh, where we hold political leadership. And in Malaysia and other places of this type, occasionally there will be issues and events uh, and incidents where uh, the question of how Muslims should react to any offense to its religion becomes very, very relevant. Mm -hmm. And for our international audience, one such incident has recently occurred in Malaysia where uh, a, a printing or a, an apparel, a, a pair, 14 pairs of socks were printed, had the printing of uh, Allah on, on it, on them. So basically, you know, for, for Muslims, it's very, very hard to swallow uh, the idea of having God's name printed on an apparel that we wear on our feet. All indications are that was an accident. It wasn't something that was purposely done by the uh, business right. relevant in this case. But it obviously caused a lot of consternation and a lot of debate within Malaysia among Muslims, among Muslims and non-Muslims of what the right and proper reaction is. There has been calls to boycott uh, this particular chain of shops that were carrying these socks. Uh, and that has also created obviously an environment in which people are very angry and some unfortunate incidents and attacks on those shops. Isolated incidents, but incidents nonetheless have occurred. Mm. So doctor, I don't want to necessarily talk about, we don't want to necessarily talk about that incident per se, but use that as a window, as an introduction to the broader question of what the right and proper role of Muslims in majority positions. Mm. And is there, apart from just the boycott, are the counter reaction as well from the Muslim side? So are the counter reactions included, like I said, uh, a couple of incidents petrol where- Petrol bombs. Where petrol right. bombs were thrown, thrown. into mm. the shops. Right. Uh, no loss of life, uh, Alhamdulillah, but still something worrying and concerning. Yeah. And, and not to forget the messages that have been sent on social media sure. right. that go beyond just a simple the boycott of yeah. one store, so beyond but the rather yeah. beyond the pale of right. boycotting all non-Muslim right. businesses yeah. regardless. So it's, it's reached the point where- we, Correct. I think once we go into social media and the comments, right. it gets very, very dark. Right. Uh, so without being too specific, Doctor, uh, because we obviously sure. we want to speak to an international audience, People in Malaysia, people in Indonesia, people in uh, Muslim majority places, uh, we'll always get cases where our religion is, we feel an offense to it. Right. How far do we go? Okay, um, well, this is a problem, of course, not unique to Malaysia uh, for Muslims generally. Uh, in fact, if you look at the last 20 years, there have been many incidences involving quote unquote provocation, Muslim provocation, provocation against, you know, our beliefs, you know, Muslims, and whether these are deliberate or not, and the whole Islamophobia we were talking about, whether it was part of that. So for instance, in the West, we've had examples like the cartoon controversy. Charlie instance, Hebdo. The Charlie Hebdo example, and the teddy bear thing. I mean, there's a lot of these, you know, a lot of these sorts of examples, right? So where the sanctity of one's religion is basically at stake it is seen, you see. So how do we react to it? And it's completely understandable, as I mentioned, in the political context in which we live in today, where there is this effective polarization, that culture wars go going on, that of course feelings will run high and we do not know whether there are Asian provocateur or not, you know, we don't want to be conspiracy theories here or anything like that, but then, you know, that's always a possibility, you see, that we should be mindful that that is the case. 
On this particular case in Malaysia, of course, I'm mindful of the fact that this is an ongoing case. It's an ongoing police case. So, you know, we don't want to, you know, we don't know until the end of the investigation and all that. But assuming so, right, as said that that is the case indeed, and particularly now that there is the reaction uh, uh, on the Muslim side uh, uh, of, of not only boycott, but, you know, the, 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 the physical attacks on the shops. My real you know, thinking on this is particularly when you look at all the instances where we do have these sort of uh, Muslim attacks, if you like, deliberately or not, or provocated or not, or otherwise, I'm reminded of, in fact, the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in the beloved messenger himself. During his most difficult year of his mission, sometimes known as the year of sadness, actually, Lost his wife. This is the sign. Uh, that's right. Lost and his the uncle, uh, uncle yeah, his guardian. His protector, yeah, Ta- Abu Ta'if, Abu Ta'if, he was Ta'if, uh, exactly. rejected by Ta'if. So, so he, exactly. So he went, he, 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 tried to, he tried to go and check out, you know, scope out, if you like, a new territory, Ta'if, to, you know, spread the word, right? And then when he was in Ta'if, look at exactly what happened. I mean, he went there and he was hounded out of time. He threw stones at him. And who threw the stones? These were kids. kids. These were and people who can't take care of their emotions. They were, you know, again, people who were very reacting against, you know, because they were, you know, there were people orchestrating against the Prophet, you know, there were provocations against the Prophet, etc. etc. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was injured. This is the great messenger of God, the final messenger of mankind. You know, the, he was really pelted with stones. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did what? Sent the arching, arch, archangel Jibril alayhi salam, Gabriel alayhi salam, came to his, you know, to his, to his aid. The angels were then sent to, if you want to zap all these people off, we'll zap all these people off, you know, like uh, in the cartoons, you know. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was given the choice to destroy them. But he stood back, stepped back, and instead said no. Do not attack them. Do not attack those who attack me. Right? And instead, you know, he's repelling evil with what is better here. He instead made the dua that the generation of these people will be true believers for which they truly are today. MashaAllah. So this is a lesson for us. The, the yeah. person of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, himself being attacked physically. Right? Physically. Look at the magnanimity of the Prophet, the generosity of the Prophet in this case. So my advice on this is that you can do what you can in order to protest or do whatever it is that you feel to protest the sanctity of religion, but do not break the law. You do not go beyond the confines of the law of this land or any other land in that matter. This is why Muslims are law-abiding human beings, no matter in which country you are in. And it's understandable. It, we understand, but it is not an excuse. It is not an excuse because we go back to the time of the Prophet. Look, this most difficult time, the year of his sadness. Look at what he did. He did not just turn the other cheek. He didn't turn. He actually did something positive that he made to our which which mm. of. He did, you know. And we must remember, Malaysia, for instance, is a very interesting country. You know, it's a country where it is a Muslim majority country. It is the, you know, one of the few countries in the world I can think of. In one article of the Constitution of Malaysia, Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution says, Islam is the, fed- is, is the religion of the Federation mm. and any other religion may be practiced in peace and harmony in any part of the Federation. Wow. In this one article of the Constitution, you have an Islamic principle being as- asserted and at the same time, a so-called secular principle being asserted which is the freedom of religion here, but I don't like to use the term secular. Hans Kung uses the term secularity. The meaning here is not secular in the sense of the French madhab, laicite, that you can't even uh, display Express, uh, yeah. you know, religious uh, objects and things like that. And hence why hijab is banned in schools, for example. But simply secularity in the sense that there is freedom of religion. Just as the Quran says, lakum dinukum waliyadin. This is an amazing country where you actually have freedom of religion, where, but the established religion is Islam. It's like the UK. The established church is the Church, church of, of England, England. The Anglican. Mm-hmm. But, you know, King Charles sees himself as the defender of, you know, not just the, the, the Christian faith, but also the faith, other faiths as well. So here our king and our rulers, 
you know, who are heads of the Islamic religion, they are not only the defender of the Muslim faith, but they are also the guarantor of the other faith as well. I like and, that. and why do I need to say this? This is important, particularly in this context. We must not break our own law. And I mean by that also not just our own public law in Malaysia, but our own Sharia laws. Yep. Do you know that in Islamic law, you know, in Islamic law, to oppress non-Muslims is basically, you know, haram. That's number one. Eh? To oppress non Muslim. This is agreed upon by all the four schools of Islam, all of the four Muslim Islam, including the Shias, by the way. So this is there's a consensus, there's a universal consensus. You cannot oppress non non-believers. What's even more interesting, in the Hanafi school, which is one of the Ahli Sunnah wal Jama'ah school, they even go beyond this and they say, and you know, in the Shafi, my Imam Ibn Hajar al Haytami says this in one of his works called uh, 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 Zawajir uh, an Iktiraf al Kabair, to 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 uh, uh, you know remove or to to keep away from basically committing major sins. This is one of his major works. You know, basically listing all the major sins. So he lists as one of the major sins. This is a of jurist in the Shafi school saying to oppress non-Muslims. But the Hanafi scholars and he they went beyond by saying, especially if the non-Muslim is a citizen of your country, a zimmi, a muwatun in the modern te- in, the, in the modern sense, a zimmi meaning, you know, you 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 are citizens of the country. So if it is a sin to oppress non-Muslims, it is worse to oppress non-Muslims if they are citizens. And most interestingly. Yeah, the, the Hanafis, you know, this is the school of the the, the Khilafah Uthmaniyah, the Ottoman Caliphs. That's why they have multiculturalism in their in their lands. Islam is the religion of the Caliphate, but other religions thrive at the same time. And there are always episodes of this in the Ottoman story that people, you know, provoke. And it's normal. It's you know, unfortunately, people who are Juhala, people who are ignoramuses. But it is the duty of the leaders, duty of the politicians, the duty of those who are supposed to be leading us to speak up about the truth in these matters. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kunu kawamina bil qisti shuhada alillah wa la ala anfusikum awil akrabin awil walidain wal akrabin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah An-Nisa verse 135 right Oh you who believe stand up for justice uphold justice you know, as witnesses to God, even if it is against yourself, your people, <laughs> you know, even if they are believers in this case, even if it is against yourself, even if it is yours against yourself or against your parents or against your relatives, the rule of law must be upheld. Uh, so we- this is where we need to ensure the safety of everybody concerned. It is absolutely understandable what has happened has inflamed feelings. Absolutely. But two ends does not justify, you know, uh, two wrongs, sorry. Uh, do not make it right. Do, 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 do make it right. Absolutely. Just like, we don't want to be like the Israelis. Right? And we don't want to be people who break the law in this case. So, but in, in this debate, if you just to, to, to come back to this particular example where, you know, Allah was printed on footwear. Right. And that obviously is sacrilege for us. Absolutely. To the, some Muslims in Malaysia, they are trying to weigh between the importance of defending the sanctity of the faith. Mm. And that trumps, sorry, I hate using that word trumps, but that, that, yep, that yep. outweighs, so, that outweighs. The double meaning of trumps. That, that, yes. that outweighs compassion and forgiveness. Mm. So how do you weigh this? Well, I mean, th- this is one of the big differences between the, I mean, the, the, this, this final religion, Islam, interestingly, and the rest of the world, because the rest of the world do not understand with the cartoon controversy, with everything including this, because they don't take religion seriously. It's just a fact. MashaAllah, this is, this, this is what makes us unique in that sense. Religiosity mm. is something that's within our psyche, if you uh, even for among those of us who, if we say we don't practice, you know, we, this is the very minimum that if if you touch this article of faith, we, even if, if the person may be a, a, a drunkard, uh, takes up drugs or whatever it is, you know, mm. this is the, the, the thing that he or she will feel, I need to do this for my faith, right? 
And this is something which certainly in a in a in a in a civilization, particularly in the West, where religion doesn't really play that, um, you know, it's really not so much in public life anymore compared to in Muslim countries where it is. You see, of course, this is the big difference. So again, as I said, the fact that if they have those feelings means actually they have iman. <laughs> in that sense, they have faith. But how does that go to forgiveness? So this is where. They have to struggle. This is like you're being tested by God, just as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was tested in Taif, but he did not break the law. He did not try to uh, make uh, uh, two wrongs make a right. In this case, he did not. Uh, uh, you know, he withheld his high ground. Gandhi would have been proud with his, in this case, non-resistance. But it's not a complete non-resistance. For example, he did make dua. He did do things in effect later on that changed Taif actually, in creative and different interesting ways. But how do we then change and shift from that faith that we, you know, that means you yeah, that's a mark of faith. You have to have, mashallah. This is really where, you know, true faith must come in. If I can this jump is in, really where you know you, you know you 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 have to flip. This is really where you really have to ask Allah to open your heart so that you have a lot of this sabar and tawakkul just now that we talked about. Mm. It's not an easy thing, I mm. know. But don't forget to have sabar and tawakkul, as I said, is not the same thing as meek submission. Sure. No one can do. You know, we are not saying do nothing, but no one can do just about anything. Is also the point there. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. If I can be slightly provocative. Sure. Um, I think what you both have just discussed is the right and proper way for people who genuinely feel offended mm-hmm. and would like to stand up for his or her religion, but in a way that is dignified, in a mm-hmm. way that does not contravene our own mm-hmm. rules and laws, not mm-hmm. just national laws, but yep. the Sharia law and what we're taught to do and be. But I want to be provocative by suggesting this, by suggesting that for some people, maybe that's not even the intention, doctor, that it could be that Oftentimes, the need to perform the religion, the performativity of your religion, the performative aspect is of the actually religion, yeah. an egotistical uh, expression. Mm. And I say this not by judging other people, but maybe judging myself and being honest with myself. There might have been moments in my life, and maybe until today, in which I feel the need to express and exhibit my Muslimness, mm. not in the way I act, but in what I say and what I do, and mm-hmm. it needs to be public, it needs to be on social media. You know, now K- KJ and I are out of politics for the moment. You know, KJ will notice how many- <laughs> Notice the qualification. Yeah, yeah, that's why our other podcast is actually called that Keluar Sekejap oh. out for the moment. All right. Um, but right. in any case, doctor, just to, just to share, politicians in Malaysia, including myself, would have at times purposely show a picture of us praying and put it on Instagram, put it on social right, media. Right. And that's an expression, that's a performance of my right. religiosity. Yeah. And on something like this, I wonder whether for some, mm. uh, the expression of anger, expression of uh, being, being upset with what's happened is also about me. It's not so much not always gonna be about Allah, mm. it's about me. Mm. And if it's about more about me and not about my God, mm. presumably doctor, that's wrong. Yeah, well, you've answered your own question, if I may say so. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice mirror there. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. So the one who's actually exhibiting those demonstrations, you actually, you are showing yourself. And in many respects, whether because if you are an unhinged person, we respect, you know, not balance, you know, it will, it will display itself and that's understandable. But this is why we do need our faith at, in those times. It's really that will give you that grounding. It will give you those roots if you're true to your faith. That's why I said the answer to that shift that currently is actually seeking there, you know, from, yeah, your faith is being tested by showing some provocation there, deliberate or not, you know. But then if you really have true faith, right? Billah to hear Ahsan just now, right? You will cool down. You will, you know, but that is a test of our character. And and this is not to judge anyone, by the way, just because you know somebody yeah. does it differently, and we don't know their intentions. Exactly. We can never we do know, not their, know intentions. their intentions. In fact, you you touch on a wider interesting thing, perhaps not only vis-a-vis Malaysia in this region, but Muslim politics generally, where there is this whole issue in the Middle East, you know, 
at going all the way to Southeast Asia, to the New Santa, and this whole question about, you know, there are politicians who politicize religion. Yeah. And that in itself can be problematic as well, because, and then this is, this is why, for example, when, when people politicize religion, it can be a bad thing. Because if you end up, if you end up basically saying that because of one's, you know, you, you, you know, essentially what we mean by that is that we politicize religion, that means, you know, you believe your policies to be the only right ones and the other policies to be, to be wrong. <laughs> and therefore, if you, if you, you know, if you follow these policies, then, you know, you will be saved. You will have salvation and, you know, it's the other way around there. That is equally as dangerous as well, you know, because then, you know, this in interesting performative action of your faith, whether you want to get votes for it, which is natural for politicians to do. So we have to, in the end, be answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day, right? And so for a country to succeed anywhere, don't play around with this heady mix of religion and nationalist populism. Mm. It can be very dangerous, really. Yeah. And this is where we need to reset that kind of, that tone of that, that, that debate, the tone of the political engagement to the Malays have a nice from Khairi state, you know, saying, Sawa Matang. I don't know how to translate that into English, Khairi. A very seasoned kind of. You know, seasoned brown, brown, brownish. Kind of, you know. earthly, well done. It's, earthly, it's a well done. Yeah, it's a, yeah. you know, not raw, not medium to yeah. well done, but it's really well done. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so the, you see, I, I have a, I have a, 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 a legal, a fiqh maxim, a sharia maxim that I coined myself through my own experience of, 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 you know, having studied with the ulama and now teaching, of course. Al-madahibu fil fiqhi kal ahzabi fi siyasa. Very simple. If you have Arabic, you can, you know, learn that. It's very nice. In the same way that we can agree to disagree when it comes to the questions of Islamic law in the madhabs of fiqh, you know, the four schools of law. Can you imagine we are Shafi'is, you pray next door with somebody who is Maliki or Hanafi or Amali when you go to Mecca, when you go to the Haram, or even here in Malaysia, you have a lot more Muslims who come from different madhabs, including Shias, for example. I mean, you know, so with the other school, the other mother, you, you don't even bite an, bat an eyelid. Mm. So in the same way we can actually agree to disagree with difference of opinion in madhabs, surely more so we can agree to disagree fil ahzabi siyasa, in political parties. Political. So we are not saying that there is no politics in Islam. I mean, you know, this is, no, that is, but there is party political in Islam there that because, you know, the point is you have a different issue, a different subjective view as to what policy is the better and the right one. That is the sort of culture that we need to teach more Muslims, not just in this country, but the rest of the Muslim country. Because otherwise you will end up having in some countries, I won't mention countries, you know, authoritarian rule. At least in Malaysia, you have, you know, this is a parliamentary mm. democracy with a constitutional monarchy, uh, Westminster style a la Malaysia, <laughs> you know. But, you know, and we are kind of we're going through growing pains. And Alhamdulillah, our country has had experience of change of government for the last few years now. And I think Malaysia is an example where unfortunately, it's usually the case where whenever Britain sneezes, we catch the cold. But now we, uh, <coughs> we, 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 we sneezed in, was it three years we had three prime minister and now Britain had one year in three prime minister or something mm. like that. <laughs> we were exporting a, a kind of a bad example there, but you know, but. That aside, we must learn to be politically mature and learn to argue and debate in parliament so that we can, you know, argue using arguments. And it's to move away from that effective, effective polarization yes. to issues polarization. Yeah, yeah. Right? I think that's, that's a great sort of uh, way to wrap that conversation up. But, you know, one great response that I've gotten for Kindred Stories, and this is my last question to you, uh, Fifi, mm. has been from non-Muslim friends who've listened to Kindred Stories in order to learn more about Islam. Coming back to, and this is just a basic question to dispel a common perception out there. So coming back to the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he went through in his year of sadness, with the deaths, with the embargo, with what happened in Ta'if. And you said he repelled that with something better. Mm. But it always comes back to, in the Western consciousness, the Prophet as a military right. leader right. because of the conquest that happened. 
the in the popular myth not necessarily myth but in the popular canon in the west of islam at the tip of a sword mm. khalid al walid the, the sword, sword, sword yeah. of sword of islam right and we can't deny that during the prophet and of course during the rightly guided caliphs there was massive expansion yep. beyond uh, half the, the hijaz world. to the levant yeah. and half the world yep. so how do you speak to a non muslim who has that perception in the mind mm. you know muhammad didn't just repel with prayer yeah exactly there was a military yeah. campaign indeed and there is balance and that's why we in the islamic religion we have the law of war a law of war like what we now know today geneva the geneva convention for example i mean it's interesting that if you look at the history of religions in the christian tradition they had to work on their so called law of war just war theory right from the time of saint augustine this is before the time of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam right all the way to thomas aquinas almost 100 years 100 years i'm sorry 1000 years given take whereas in islam in the very first verse revealed in the quran about warfare right in surah al baqarah uh, i think it's verse 190 in wa qatilu fi sabilillahi alladhina yuqatilunakum wa la ta'tadu inna allah yuhibbul mu'tadin you know amazing verse of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this one verse of the quran it god says and fight those who fight you in the path of god right so fight those who fight you in the path of god and then do not transgress wala ta'tadu inna allaha yuhibbul mu'tadin for god does not love those who transgress in this one verse khairi now you did your ppe in oxford you had your lovely philosophy tutorials one of the things you will learn about the law of war just was here is that you have what is called you know the the jus et bellum and the jus in bello consideration so i'm sorry this is a bit technical so when you talk about going to war is this a just war or not just yep. at bellum consideration and then just in bello is the conduct of war when you fight in a war you need to fight as i said earlier in the case of gaza not you know you need to follow the rule of war right the, you know the, you know which the israelis clearly are not you know <laughs> so um in 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 this verse in the one verse eh, the first part of the verse says fight those who fight you so this is the just at bellum consideration and the next part of the verse is wala ta'tadu and do not break the law <laughs> is the just in bello consideration mashallah in the one verse of the quran a whole almost 1000 year of christian history to develop the just war theory is unraveled in the one verse Mashallah. and that is because subhanallah alazim the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not only having a, a jesus like mission alaihi salam in mecca when he preached in mecca the first 10 years of his life In Mecca, this was his mission. Was like Nabi Allah Isa alayhi salam, because he did not have a state. He was not a general, nor was he a statesman. He was like all of us in that sense that you know he didn't have power, but he also had the Medinan phase of his life, the Meccan and the Medinan phase. So when he went to Medina after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the community, he basically ruled as almost a city state, mm. right? And he became a general, and that is no longer the mission of Jesus, Allah Subhanahu because Jesus never had a state, right? It was like the mission of Moses, Allah Subhanahu, or rather David, Allah Subhanahu, or Solomon, Allah Subhanahu, Sulaiman, Allah Subhanahu. So it's interesting. This is why our Prophet Muhammad Sallam is seen to be the perfect messenger. He brings both of this. So he performed the mission of Jesus of this idfaq billati here ahsan when he was in Taif. He's not turning the other cheek. He's repelling with something better than evil. Yeah, but he didn't have power. I mean, military power to change the facts on the ground, for example. Mm. But when he had power to change the facts on the ground, mm. he made sure to change the world to become a better place. And it just so happens that through the accident of history and the miracle of history, and certainly everybody who studies Islamic history, you know, from Hodgson to anybody else, Gibbon, the rise and fall, <laughs> civilization. You know, They all say the same thing that it is wow one of these great accident miracle of history that like the muslim basically conquered half the known world why because in the end we save civilization it is true but in every history there are atrocities and all that of course but not with our prophet peace be upon him nor his sahabi and imagine you know you you give the example of khalid bin walid right you give the example of 
you know, <laughs> you give the example of those Sahabis who fought alongside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was one Sahabi who basically, you know, and this is the example when, you know, after Khalid became Muslim, so he then, uh, you know, had one of the enemies on the ground and he ended up killing the person. Even when the person shattered, surrender. uttered, uh, surrender, I said, and La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Shada. Right? Uh, you know, and then when he was reprimanded by the Prophet why did you do that? Oh, I know he's an inveterate liar. Uh, uh, kazab, you know, he's an inverted liar. I know he, this guy from very young, blah, 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 blah. You know, one of the Sahabi did this. And then the Prophet said, well, did you cut open his heart to see that he had faith? How dare you? Wow. Allah, you know. That is why when you say Islam being the religion of a sort, yes, in places like Andalusia. But look at what happened to Andalusia. Islam did not last there. Alhamdulillah, Islam is coming back there. Right? But historically, after 1492, it mm. didn't last there. And one of the benefits I had the occasion, mashallah, you have a, you know, one of the great scholars from Southeast Asia, Habib Hassan al Taz from Singapore, wonderful friend. And he, he had this wonderful insight. He said, whenever Islam is spread by the sword, it doesn't last in that sense, you know. <laughs> but look at in the Nusantara, in Southeast Asia. Mm. Mm. He did not spread by the sword. Mm. Never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it came here by the Sufis. The Sufis brought Islam to this country, to this region, uh, from Hadramaut, from Yemen, uh, mashallah, from India, and even from China. And 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 Islam was spread here through trade, commerce, and 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 Muslims who came here, they were they were sailors, and they wore certain, you know, the, the locals. Well, normally, you know, they don't wash themselves, kind of quote, unquote, dirty or whatever, but they see all these clean people, they come and, wow, I mean, they, they, they really look like holy people and they are holy people and they end up becoming Muslim. I mean, the Sultan of Malacca became Muslim and the rest became Muslim, you know? So, and the rest, as they say, is history. Mm. And Alhamdulillah, till today, Islam lasts today compared to what happened in Spain. So, I think this is a lesson for us all. I mean, I think in the sense that, of course, you know, so I, you know, with my own students and I've had students who, Alhamdulillah, I mean, this is, you know, they say Hidayah is in the hands of Allah, Da'wah is in the hands of mankind. <laughs> mm. You know, people who become and enter the faith. Alhamdulillah. In all my years of teaching and I, you know. But I learn a lot from them equally as well. I mean, it's a very humbling experience. And this is where we cannot be judgmental on these matters. And people will always be judgmental, Khairi, I know. People will always think that Islam is the worst religion because of this, you know. And, but this is when with knowledge, you know, light comes and darkness falls and falsehood disappears. So really, and that's the beautiful quality of not only being in Oxford, the very Islamic quality really, but the Prophet, and I love it and I want to end here perhaps when I just heard the two of you, particularly when you say that this uh, 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 is podcast, you say, right? This kindred stories is about Seeking knowledge and sowing kindness. Sowing kindness. You know, itlabul ilm in Arabic, right? You know, it's it's seeking itlabul ilm while I'll seen. And the Prophet said in a beautiful, weak da'if hadith, but equally usable. Just because it, you know, there are Muslims today who are allergic, you can't use a da'if hadith. All of them. Oh dear. No. It is seek knowledge even unto the final frontiers of knowledge, like Star Trek. You know, where boldly go where no 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 one has gone before. That's a very Islamic quality, absolutely. But why do you seek knowledge? It's because you want to sow kindness. Because the Prophet ﷺ also taught us, if you ta'am, spread peace, you know, uh, to mankind. You know, give salam to people. How do you how do you sow kindness eh? by sharing food? <laughs> you know, so and I think I think, you know, given that this is the month of Ramadan, the last 10 nights of Ramadan, mashallah, and we're having Eid very, very soon, you know. So Selamat Hari Raya, whatever it is you want to say, and you know, and I miss that saying, Selamat Hari Raya, Ma'af Zaibatin, the only Muslims who do this, are in all my travels throughout all the Muslim lands and non-Muslim lands as well, the Middle East to China and South Africa and everywhere, it's, we are really the only people on the face of the earth who say, Selamat Hari Raya, Eid Mubarak, you know, and Afwan Zahiran Batin, I have to translate it into Arabic that, you know, Ma'af Zahibatin, please forgive me for my forgive trespasses. Forgive me, body and soul. Yeah, body and soul. Body and and soul. this is, these are the sort of things that Malaysians, 
Indonesians, you know, Malaysians, Brunei and Singaporeans, Southern Thais and Southern Filipinos must export. The Nusantara Muslims must export to the rest of the Muslim world. We should be proud of that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing. Uh, so it's good to say Eid Mubarak, no problem. It's very Arabic and all that, <laughs> very Indian. And but let us not forget our own Malay heritage. Yeah? And that Selamat Hari Raya, Maaf, Zahir, Batin. And I think it's one of the marvels of life. Yes. In all my travels, yes. I'm still amazed at my home and I'm still still traveling, still haven't come home yet. Inshallah, one day when I retire, perhaps, uh, Khairi. <laughs> but I look forward to having you for a sabbatical in Oxford well, soon enough. Well, right? to our modern day Ibn Battuta, continue with your travels, uh, <laughs> my friend. And seek knowledge until the uh, ends, ends of the of, earth. Of the, of the <laughs> earth. <laughs> Cheryl, any last words from you? <laughs> Just to say, well, this is a fantastic and, and really illuminating conversation, Doctor. Thanks well, so I, much. I'm for, the one who's benefiting from yeah. it. And I seek think knowledge and still kindness. Really fantastic is. exposition of why Islam is a religion of compassion, mm. how we balance extremes, and how we go forth in this world. So, thank you very much for your time. Eid Mubarak. Maaf Zaibatin. Selamat hari raya. Maaf Zaibatin. Ibn Barak kulu antum antum bikhair. Thank you very much. <laughs>